Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Jake Williams Show right here on loudopinionated.com or wherever you get your podcasts. I always flub that up, so I was glad I actually got that right. <laughs> episode 27 of The Jake Williams Show. Uh, this this episode is going to be interesting. It'll be something a little different. Uh, last week, I was fired up. I was very angry, and uh, I wanted to do something a little bit lighter, a little bit different. And uh, I, to to prove that, I'm even doing this show in my sweatpants on my couch because that's how relaxed I want to be for episode 27 of the Jake Williams Show. Uh, before I go any further, you know I'm going to say it, so I say it every week. I have some uh, housekeeping to uh, get out of the way. I want everyone to uh, check out all the other great podcasts that are on loudandopinionated.com. We have Loud Sports. You know, me, Paul Rubidoux, Brandon Plecker going back and forth talking about all the things that are happening in sports. Um, a lot about the AAF because... I don't think enough people talk about that league, and I think that's so. I think it's going to be a very successful football league, and I think more people should take notice and, and pay attention to it. We talk about possible expansion, some of the cities they could be expanding to, things like that. That is currently up on loudopinionated.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And then the Underachievers. It's the gaming podcast I do with John Sparks and Chance Oliver. Talk everything in the gaming industry. This week was a little different. We put up our first episode of Party Chat, where it is just us. It's just the audio from us playing video games together. Now I know that sounds a little weird. How would that work as audio on your, you know, on your podcast feed? But you'll find out that we rarely ever actually talk about the game that we're playing, and we're just bullshitting with friends. That's just really what it is. And I think you you might like it. I hope you do, and we'll keep making more episodes of that. And uh, we also do episodes based on gaming news and everything else. So without further ado, check out those podcasts after you listen to the rest of this one. This is going to be something that I haven't done before and I actually wanted to do for a long time. Let's get into episode 27, In Defense of Zack Snyder's Watchmen. So, uh, March 6th, so that would have been Wednesday of this week, was the 10-year anniversary of the Watchmen movie directed by Zack Snyder. Um, I actually am in the camp that really likes that movie, hence the title of this episode. I even have the director's cut, so that's over three hours. I don't have the ultimate cut because I feel like that's almost four hours. And it's a lot like The Lord of the Rings, where it's like, all right, if the movie is three hours, I really don't need to see the director's cut. That's another hour. I think I got enough out of the movie, and I think I know where I'm going with this. So let's just jump into Watchmen. And this is a weird um, fandom I have for Watchmen, because I, I am in the stereotypical camp that actually really likes Watchmen. Um, I'd love to have Adam on one of these times on this show to talk about, because he's a novel, but actually likes the movie. And I think that would actually open up an interesting dynamic. But Watchmen is interesting for me because this is a movie that I went in and saw pretty much blind. I did not read the comic before I went into the movie. I had really no idea what I was getting into, and I actually came out enjoying it. So it released March 6th, 2009. At this time, I am a freshman in high school, and I didn't really think anything of it. I saw a few trailers here and there. The first trailer I saw, and I could be wrong on this, but I think the first trailer that ever came out for this movie was, it might have been during the Super Bowl, but I th I think the like actual extended idea of what we're getting here with the trailer, because if it was the Super Bowl, it could have been just a 30-second TV spot. But the first, like, elaborate trailer that I saw was before The Dark Knight, which is easy marketing for DC. This is a darker superhero movie. People are already going to go see this darker movie, so maybe they might check out Watchmen. And there's obviously crossover between Watchmen fans 
and Batman fans. It's it's pretty obvious outside of that. Granted, at the time, I didn't even know what Watchmen was. I remember watching the trailer for it before The Dark Knight and just kind of thinking, okay, this looks interesting, but I have no idea what the like, no frame of reference, no idea what the hell is going on here on screen. From there, I never thought, hey, I really want to see this movie. I'd never had that uh, itch to go see it. Um, but then my buddy, who um, I don't know if he listens to the show, but Austin, I'm going to be talking about you. My buddy from high school, Austin, who I haven't seen in a while, and uh, I hope to get on this show or get on his show eventually. Um, he was telling me about it. And him and I had very similar taste in movies, and I'm sure we probably still do, but we had very similar taste in movies. And he's like, no, you got to go see this movie, Watchmen. It's, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be crazy. And I don't remember if he said he had read the comic book beforehand, but I just remember like the week of the movie coming out, he kept, you know, trying to hype me up to get go see it, and I was always like, I don't know, man, I, I don't know. And then he, you know, showed me some more, like, promotional trailers as movies do. They keep releasing a little bit of footage before the movie was coming out, and I still was just like, I, I don't know, man. I just, it doesn't. I never read the books. It doesn't really, uh, you know, hook me. And then, you know, something struck me. I think it was the Friday of that movie coming out. I was just like, you know what? And I was with Tommy, who's ha- who has been on this show. I was like, you know what? You know, screw it. Let's go see this movie. What's what's the worst can happen? Now, this is where the story gets really funny for me, because everything leading up to this was not planned, and then everything after this is woefully underestimated. So I grew up in uh, a smaller town in Nebraska. I grew up in Nebraska City, about seven thousand people. And we don't, we have the one movie theater that everybody goes to. I think there's only like three screens. I have, I will say this: it is good for a small town movie theater if you've never been to a bigger city and been to like legitimately good uh, movie theaters. Because man, oh man, was this a this was not a great theater. I think they did what they could, but you know they're not going to be competing with bigger chains like a Marcus or a AMC. I digress. We go to the theater. We want to go to the theater, but at the time, I am a freshman in high school. Tommy is an eighth grader because he was a year behind me. And uh, we're not 17, so we can't get into this R-rated movie by ourselves. So I have to rope in my mom and say, look, mom... I, I, I'll pay for everything. I have the money because I had a you know, part-time job, I, uh, high school job. Uh, and <laughs> I said, I'll pay for it. Just I need you to go in with me and say that <laughs> we have your permission to see this movie, which I don't think ever works in any scenario because it just reminds me of uh, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, when they get the homeless person. To get them into the movie. That was the kind of uh, mentality. Because I knew my mom wasn't going to be interested in this movie. This is not a movie. You know. She would really want to watch. So do some chores or whatever you want me to do. Just say that I can go to this movie. And she was upset about it. Because again I wasn't of 17. I didn't have a driver's license at the time either. I didn't have a car. So she had to drive me there. Bring me in. To say, yeah, these guys can see the movie. Then to just leave and go home. Because we're like, yeah, we'll walk back. Because <laughs> I didn't live super far from the theater. Uh, so, yeah, we get into the movie. And I know that it's R-rated. So I know that, that it's going to be a different experience than what I'm used to su- to superhero movies. But, in again, no frame of reference. Not reading the graphic novel beforehand. In my head, I just thought... Oh, it'll probably, you know, they'll say the F word a few more times and the violence might be amped up a little bit. That's that's pretty much all I was getting into. Then I proceed to go on a two and a, two hours and I want to say 45 minute journey into Watchmen. And yes, it had the violence. Yes, it had the language. Then it had the sex. And there's just so many different hard R things that are being thrown at me while I'm sitting in this movie theater. And, you know, I came out liking it. That was me as a freshman 
in high school. Jumping, you know, 10 years later, I've recently rewatched the director's cut because I have that on Blu-ray, Steelbook. Yeah, that's how much of a fan I am. I've recently rewatched it 10 years later, wiser. You know, I was 15 then, I'm 25 now. I, I think I, I got a bigger idea of my opinion of movies and how it's changed over 10 years. I have to say, I still really enjoy Watchmen. Also, real quick, I want to back up. Another funny story about watching this in the theater. Uh, <laughs> where the scene in the, uh, the infamous scene in um, Night Owl's ship with him and Silk Spectre, where they are full-on plowing into each other. I'll never forget this because I sat behind Austin and um, my other friend Robbie and Austin's dad. I sat behind them with Tommy, and we were just sitting there watching this sex scene unfold. And we are 14 to 15-year-old boys, so we are, like, glued to this scene. And uh, I'll never forget it. He, His dad looked at him in a very awkward way of, like, really? This is the movie you drug me to and you made me go see with you? This is the movie? I'll never forget that. That was it's one of the funniest experiences I've had at a theater. Just because the look of pure not even it's not disappointment, it's just like, really, dude? This how are we gonna explain this to mom? That was kind of the look he gave it to him. Because uh, what if mom sees this later and then she I have to explain this that I took you to a movie theater to see it. So yeah, I had a great time with it at the theater ten years ago. Ten years na- later. Um, I still enjoy it. I really do. I think Zack Snyder's Watchmen, I think, is the best attempt to make this a movie. The problem with Watchmen, and this is just with Alan Moore's work, and this is just Alan Moore's uh, kind of pretentious about this stuff. You know, it's written for comic books. It's supposed to only be a comic book. Everybody forever said that Watchmen was unfilmable. You couldn't be done. I think... Even the theatrical cut. I think the director's cut is better because there's extra scenes in this that are actually from the the graphic novel itself that aren't in the theatrical cut. Even the theatrical cut, I think, is impressive because it is so dense. Alan Moore, anytime he works on a project, he makes it incredibly dense. There are a lot... There's... a what is it, six main characters in this story, and they all have complexities. I mean, the one of the characters gets murdered, and it's going to be one thing, and then it goes into another direction, and there's all these different intertwined left curves in the narrative, and it's incredibly hard to pack that all into one movie, one s- solid story, because even at 2.45, and then 3 at plus with the director's cut and then almost four with the Tales from the Black uh, Freighter animated movie with that tied in. That's almost four hours. Even then they left stuff out. That's just how thick Watchmen is. So I think it should be commended for how much of an achievement it is to make that into a single narrative. And it has flaws. Every movie has flaws. I don't think Watchmen is a perfect movie. It's definitely not a movie for everyone, but that's probably the biggest compliment I can make to it because I don't think that the graphic novel itself is for everyone. I don't think everybody would have the same experience or like this story as much as someone else because, I mean, the tone in and of itself, it's a very dark story. It's a very bleak story. The bad guy wins. Excuse me. The bad guy wins in this. And I'll talk about the ending in a little bit, how it's different from the movies. But just on the surface, I want to talk about the things in why I still like Watchmen. And I still think, you know, even after 10 years, it's still a very, I don't want to say serviceable or adequate. I think it's a really good superhero movie. The way that it it treats its source material and the way 
that it's directed, I think, should be commended. I definitely got the feeling that Zack Snyder really did like Watchmen, and this was a very important project to him. And to go from 300 to this, go well, actually, go, to go from Dawn of the Dead to 300 to this, I thought he was on a great streak, and then he kind of ruined it with Sucker Punch and the DCEU movies. But, you know, that that's beside the, beside the point. I think in this single scenario with Watchmen, I think there was a lot of passion and respect to Alan Moore's work that is almost unparalleled with other movies. And I think what makes Watchmen work so well and so palatable for me is, yes, it is a long movie, but it's that. It's it. There's no other story to it. It's part of the reasons why I like Venom, because we're at a... It, don't get me wrong. I love the MCU. I love the fact that we have team-up movies and we have things like the Avengers. Those are great, and I love them. But every now and then, it is refreshing to sit down, watch a superhero movie, knowing that this is it. There's no other things tied to this. It's by itself. It's a singular thing. You watch it. You enjoy it. That's it. There's just something nice about that. And we don't get that a lot anymore with superhero movies. And it's, it's, it's just the direction we're going, and I'm not complaining about it. It's just refreshing. Change of pace. So, uh, another thing that I love about Watchmen. More things that I love about Watchmen. I think the cast is great. And I think Patrick... Uh, we'll just go down the line here that I can remember off the top of my head. Uh, in order of appearance, maybe. Uh, I think Jeffrey D. Morgan crushes it as the comedian. Because the comedian, to me, is a interesting character because he is unequivocally an unrelenting piece of shit. He is a horrible human being throughout this whole story. But Jeffrey Dean Morgan adds a little bit, adds a def different dimension to Eddie Blake. You know, I it, it would be so easy right off the, right out of the gate to hate him if you, you know, you have the, the frame of reference for the, the book too. And yes, later there's an attempted rape scene that is extremely violent, and we'll talk about the violence in a little bit, but it is extremely violent. And then you kind of not really feel for him anymore. And then he has another scene later when he talks about Silk Spectre where you're kind of like, you're still a really bad guy, but I kind of feel for you a little bit, and then I remember, oh yeah, you tried to rape someone, so you're still terrible person. So I think Jeffrey D. Morgan brings a whole other level to it. Patrick Wilson, I think, is a... I really like him as an actor. Uh, pretty much anything he's in, I've enjoyed him. I even loved his kind of hammy performance in Aquaman. I think what he does with Night Owl is provide something that the movie needed and it provided a, a moral compass. Like, he's not a perfect guy. But of all of these characters, he is clearly the best adjusted, the most well-adjusted of all these ex-superheroes. Because Dr. Manhattan, he's on his own weird thing. Rorschach is a psychopath. The comedian's a horrible human being. Silk Spectre's got some sort of depression. or And she's got, you know, daddy issues, mommy issues, every kind of issues on this side. So Night Owl's character is the most well-adjusted, and I think Patrick Willison's performance conveys that very well. He's a very likable character. You, you're very sympathetic to him when you find out he has ED. <laughs> so he, he adds layers to Night Owl, and I, I really do enjoy his performance. I think the best performance of the whole entire movie is easily Jackie Earl Haley's performance as Rorschach. His look is pulled directly from the comic books. He just looks... When I think of Rorschach, I think of Jackie Earl Haley. And I told you I watched the movie first. So I'd seen the movie, and then I was like, if if this is just the movie and there's other stuff I'm missing, I have to read the graphic novel. So I picked it up and, and was reading it. As I was reading it, I was reading the Rorschach journals in my head as Jackie Earl Haley. And that's who I will always think of as Rorschach. 
unequivocally, it is Jackie Earl Haley. He is he he is my Rorschach, and his performance. He. It's it's funny because I've grown to like Jackie Earl Haley because of this. You know, whatever you may feel about the the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, I thought he was a serviceable Freddy Krueger. He clearly wasn't going for the Robert England jokey Freddy, which, in all honesty, isn't what Freddy's like in the first movie. He, I thought he was, he did a good job in that, and I actually really liked him in Preacher. But I think this is probably his best performance across the board. It is, it's great. Oh well, you know, he's pretty good in The Tick too. I do enjoy him in that, but. Overall, he was the best performance in this movie, and I think this that is his best performance of his career so far that I have seen. Granted, these are my opinions. Uh, I don't remember the guy, the name of the guy that plays uh, Ozzy. In Ozzy, honestly, Ozzy Mendias, he is my least favorite character in Watchmen. I understand that he is the villain, and I'm not supposed to like him, but I just didn't think there was enough in the movie for me to hate him. Enough. I mean, what he does at the end is really terrible, but leading up to that, I never really cared about what was going on. I cared a lot more about all the other characters, so I didn't really care about Ozzy. So, and that that goes back to the graphic novel too. So I, I, you know, I think he did a good job with what he had. I think all the performances across the board aren't that bad. I thought Madeline Ackerman as Silk Spectre. I think. I don't know. I just, I think she's so much better in comedy. Whenever she does comedy, I'm, I think she's great. I just, I don't know. I, I didn't really like her performance as much. I thought, again, I didn't think any of them were bad. I just thought there were better performances in this movie. And then finally, Billy Crudup as Dr. Manhattan. Now, this is an exa- another example of the movie, seeing it first impacted how I read the graphic novel. But, yeah, every time I read the book after seeing this movie, I heard Billy Crudup's voice. I I think his performance is up there with Jackie Earl Haley with how good of a performance it is. He does an amazing job at sounding monotone but still conveying an array of emotions. And that is based on his performance. When you do see Dr. Manhattan and you, you see his interactions with people, he he doesn't really change his tone of voice until the infamous uh, interview with the cancer scene and all that. He doesn't really ever change his tone of voice, but he still conveys emotion and still lets you know of the situation you're in. And I think Billy Crudup absolutely nails it. And while we're on the topic of Dr. Manhattan, I think Dr. Manhattan's story is my favorite sequence of the whole entire movie. The music, the direction, Crudup's voiceover, everything about Dr. Manhattan's like origin story is so well done. It is my favorite sequence of the whole entire movie. And it's it is astounding that 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 scene and, you know, Rorschach's origin story it's a, it's shorter, but Rorschach's origin story is very well done too. But Dr. Manhattan's scene is late in well what, probably about 45 minutes to an hour into this movie? Maybe, well, no, no, it's probably later than that. I'd probably say probably an hour and a half. I don't know. Point is, by the time this is in the movie, most people are probably, like, winding down, waiting, you know, maybe not waiting for the movie to end, but are feeling the effects of the time. But that scene... Even when I first saw it, that particular scene was a moment when I was like, okay, I'm I'm f- even more into this than I was. 
Because I was already into the movie, but that particular scene really put me over the hump to saying that, oh, I thought it was okay, too. I really, really liked this movie. It was that sequence. Although you do kind of, and this is where I love, this is what I love about Watchmen, is that's where it really starts to take shape of none of these people are perfect. None of this is black and white. And that's where I think the, it comes full circle in the deconstruction of the superhero genre and it's done in a way that is very effective because this is i mean dr manhattan is obviously a stand-in for superman and now it's like well what if superman just said fuck you guys and flew to mars never never to come back doesn't care about human beings said he doesn't care about human beings can could literally pull a thanos destroy this whole thing in a snap of his finger but no he says you know what you're not even worth that i'm going to fly away to a planet because I don't, or teleport, technically. And go away, and I don't want to see you guys anymore. I'm tired of Earth. I'm tired of its people. And it's just so great. And I, it, it's done so effectively in this movie. I mean, if you go back to the climate of superhero movies in 2009, it's unbelievable, almost inconceivable, that this movie got a wide release. <laughs> and... And, and people enjoy like it's it's nuts. I can't go any further without forgetting to mention the opening sequence of this movie. I thought the the death of the comedian was cool. I really liked how they did that. But the opening credits to this movie are probably the best opening sequence, opening credit sequence I've seen in a movie. The how they you know make the font three D and make it a part of the scenes and how every change of scene is a, a newspaper picture of them stopping crime and then it shows the lesbian superhero and then it shows the horrible things that happen to these people and it is very effective on a storytelling front because it manages to tell that 40 years of the like the first generation of superheroes and supervillains that are in Watchmen. That's really the o- other than the Hollis Mason stuff. That's really the only big connections to that time period. And then of course you know the flashback with the comedian and the first Sith Spectre. But I love that sequence. I will watch it over and over again. Which even funnier is I saw that they had to. Tyler Bates, who did the uh, soundtrack for this movie, he had to go in and edit times they are changing because it's only like four and a half minutes long and the opening credits are like six. So he had to add an extra minute and a half or so to it. That's another thing. I think the music in this movie is well done. Very effective 80s soundtrack. Anybody that knows me knows how much I love the 80s. But I didn't know this until... uh, further research um, uh, all the songs in the movie are quoted in the book although it's Bob Dylan's all along the watchtower that's quoted it's Jimi Hendrix song and times they are a changing is quoted in that book is you know in between the chapters there's little quotes there that's in the book so again that's a great use of the media and how you can still be faithful to that story, but find a way to tell it in a movie. I, I think that's very effective. Yeah, you know, when we talk about things I didn't like, yeah, I didn't really go for Mal and Ackerman's performance. I thought that there was too much of the classic Zack Snyder ramping of scenes, like some scenes that you know, if you don't know what ramping is, it it was his style. Where it was very much in 300. There's, I don't know if he does it anymore. I don't think he he did it after um, Sucker Punch. But it's this way of filmmaking where everything is in slow motion. Like someone's getting ready to punch someone. It's in slow motion. And then once that it gets to a certain point to land that punch, it speeds up back to regular time. And the most that we saw of it was at the beginning with the comedian's death. And then you see it in the alleyway with... Um, Silk Spectre and Night Owl. And 
at the time, I thought that was cool. But 10 years later, I was like, oh, man, he really played that up. And he really tried to make that his signature style. And, uh, yeah, I did not did not go for that. Not, not a fan. Uh, but overall, I think those are just some of the things I didn't like. The violence didn't bother me as much as some people. Some people thought it was too violent. I, 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 I like gore and I like violence, so that doesn't <laughs> really bother me. Uh, I want to say something that I loved about the director's cut that unfortunately could make it to the theatrical cut. You get more time with Hollis Mason. Uh, you get Hollis Mason's death in the director's cut, and that really bothered. Not in a, in like it's a bad movie or bad scene or anything. No, it really bothered me because I remember reading into the book, and it's very similar to the book. And what I liked about this is when he's punching these thugs because these thugs break in to kill Night Owl, and uh, when they break in, he's fighting them. But as he's fighting them, they they these thugs they look like the classic villains that he used to beat up and fight back in the day. So that was nice, and then he gets murdered by his own award, which is ex- directly from the graphic novel. Didn't like it then, didn't like it in the movie, but I thought it was a really cool addition that I could see why it was scrapped for time, uh, you know, because <laughs> movie's already almost three hours on a wide release. Uh, overall, I would say, yes, even ten years later, I still really like the movie. I would like to see, I'm interested in what HBO is going to do. With a miniseries. I will say, you know, we want to talk about the impact of this movie. To me, it it, it left a good mark because it did show and it made money. People thought it was, you know, financially unsuccessful. It did make profit. It did make some more money. But it still didn't. What what a lot of people probably thought were going to happen was it was going to take off with R-rated superhero movies. And that just didn't happen. It wasn't until... Deadpool, where they were, they realized that this is a very viable choice, and then you had Logan, and then Deadpool, too, so they, those worked. I thought that after the success of Watchmen, that that's what was going to happen. We were going to see more R-rated superhero movies, and we just we just weren't there yet. So in that way, it is ahead of its time. I think the negative things that came out of it were how DC kept trying to milk the the Watchmen brand where they had before Watchmen, which is a different group of writer. It was all the like big writers that we have doing comics now were writing before Watchmen miniseries, and I just never clinged on to that because to me Watchmen works as this, what we have the movie the graphic novel. All, just what we had there is what works. And yes, there's absolute Watchmen and all these other things, but I don't want to do a go back. Is as, as interesting as it could be to think about like Rorschach and Night Owl working together in their prime, or the Minutemen and and doing a whole thing about those characters. As exciting as that would be, and to ex- explore those ideas. It goes back to the thing where I do have issues with prequels because it, it you don't need to go back and tell these stories and try and find another depth to the story. Leave that to my imagination. Let me think about those ideas and have these theories. Don't You don't need to tell me about those things. The only time I've really been behind a prequel was uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. It's the only time I've really liked a prequel and thought it was done well enough. So that imp- that is something that I think people I think DC saw that there was still money in Watchmen and they tried to make these like prequel series and I just I didn't really it didn't go I didn't like it. You know, if somebody liked it good, you know, good for them. I'm happy for them, but you know, for me I just didn't it didn't catch me. So now we have the HBO I think it's just going to be a mini series of Watchmen. Which, again, I think is very interesting that they waited, you know, 10 years to do this. I haven't seen anything uh, on it. You know, they've been very, HBO's been very hush-hush about what they're they're releasing. And I have no idea. So I'm imagining that they're going to do probably 12 episodes and do the 12 issues. Or maybe they'll put 
combine a couple issues into one episode and make it a longer episode. I just don't know what they're trying to do there. I thought that Zack Snyder's Watchmen was pretty damn faithful, and I thought it did it was very effective in what it was trying to do. So I don't know how you would expand on the mythos of Watchmen and how you do things differently. So I, I'll probably check it out just out of um, pure uh, intrigue. But yeah, this has uh, been an interesting, uh, fun episode. I'm trying to remember if I if I've missed anything that I didn't really want to you know, of all the things I want to touch on if I missed anything. Honestly, no. I think I pretty much hit everything I wanted to talk about. What did you think of Watchmen from Zack Snyder ten years ago? Have you always liked it? Did have you come around to it? Have you always hated it? It's up to you. It's, what, it's your opinion. It's loud and opinionated. That's what it's all about. Leave a comment below and let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the movie. And uh, this is fun. I've always wanted to do a retrospective review of a movie. It's just, honestly, every time I've done it, I've missed the year by <laughs> a year or so. Or just, you know, I've always missed the boat. But uh, I'm going to pay more close attention to those. I think next year uh, is the, th I want to say, 30th anniversary of Total Recall. So you better believe I'm going to watch that. And then 2001, 2001, 2021 would be, I believe, the 20th anniversary of Terminator 2. So you believe I'll do retro retrospects on those for sure. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of The Jake Williams Show. I, I Again, I want to do more uh, retrospective things, more movie discussions. Uh, I, I have a lot of fun doing those. You can get this show at loudopinionated.com or Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. Pretty much anywhere you get a podcast, we are there. And by we, I mean me because it is my show. Uh, yeah, check out. Put awesome content out for you. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Loud Sports, The Underachievers, uh, the other podcasts on loudopinionated.com. Give those a listen. I'd love to get your feedback on them. I think my co-hosts do such a great job on those shows. It's worth your time, worth your listen. And you can follow uh, Loud and Opinionated on Twitter, at Loud Opinionated. You can follow on Instagram, at Loud and Opinionated Brand. You can also like us on Facebook, which is facebook.com, Loud and Opinionated. And you know what? You can even follow me on Twitter, at a Lumberjake. Or on Instagram, too. Same thing, a lumberjake. If you want to see my food pics and just obnoxious Instagram, check it out. Please do. also want to give a quick shout-out to the YouTube channel Imperious Rex. Uh, they just released a video talking about Watchmen and talking about the 10-year anniversary of Watchmen, and that was kind of my inspiration for this. And I love that show, and I always want to do retrospective things. So it just It just worked out timing-wise. If you want to write for loudandopinionated.com, go ahead and check. Send us what you want to write about, particularly 300 to 1,000 words, blog-type format. Send that to be loud at loudandopinionated.com. We don't silence opinions. Whatever you want to talk about, we will put it up. And finally, the most important thing I always say after the Jake Williams show, be loud and be proud. <laughs>